everybody and welcome to Sunday morning worship at Morningstar Pentecostal Church right here in Camden, New Jersey. Our God is great and greatly to be praised. Go with us in Jesus' name. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Oh, how great is our God. Jesus, we thank you today, God. We thank you for bringing us together, Lord. We thank you for your wonderful and precious word, God. We thank you, Lord God, for your revealed word. We thank you for your spirit, God. We thank you for provision this morning, God. Lord, we thank you for the word that has come forth already, and we thank you, Lord, for the word that you've given us today. Lord, we speak this word today, Lord God, in power and authority according to your spirit, Lord. Let me decrease so that you might increase, Lord, and that your will would be done, Lord, in this place, in our lives, in everyone who's watching, Lord God, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome. My name is Minister Lauren Palante from Morning Star Church, where Bishop James C. Brewer is my pastor. And this morning, I have a very exciting and yet universal word for us today. And I can by no means take credit for what I'm about to say. And I mean that in the most positive way. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been hearing from different saints at Morning Star and different members. And as I keep talking to people and keep hearing things, there's a theme that has emerged. The Bible says we see in part and we prophesy in part. 
And I've been able to pick up pieces of what everyone's saying, which is a beautiful thing when you think about it. If it's an open source word and you're picking up pieces from what the other ministers and what the other saints are saying, that means we're all in the same place. We're all flowing with the same spirit and we're all hearing from the voice of God. So let me backtrack and start. How did we get on this path for this week? And it starts with Minister Nada. Um, a few weeks ago, she sent out a text, just a random morning encouragement text, and it was Ephesians 6 and 10 through 18, which is a familiar passage of scripture. But she sent it in the Message Bible, so it read a little bit differently. And I was already logged in at work, so I read it. Said, That's very nice. Put my phone down, said, yes, I'm, I'm still battling. You know, we battle not against flesh and blood, but again, against principalities and powers. And Lord, I'm still battling for my COVID. Thank you for the encouraging one. And then, about an hour later, Sister Marta sends a word, and her word was very different. And she said that the Lord had woken her up and given her the words, expect the unexpected. And again, in my daily busyness, I read the text. I said, thank you very much. That was great. Put my phone down. And the Lord stopped me where I was and said, mm -mm, look at that again because my natural inclination was to say, expect the unexpected, this is gonna be great, this is gonna be enthusiastic, but God said, no, you need to look further, you need to look deeper. So I went back and I read Sister Marta's word again, and said, expect the unexpected, I hope I'm saying it right, this is exactly what I got. And then I went back to Minister Nada's text and I read it again, but with more detail, with more focus this time. And it started to talk about being prepared for the battle, being prepared for the fight. And the Lord put that in my spirit that this is a warning. Morning star, you are getting a warning. And it's not the kind of warning that you're doing something wrong. It's the warning that you need to ready your weapons. That's the topic I'm going to speak from today. Ready your weapons. So let's take a step back and let's look at that scripture in the Message Bible. Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 18 says, and that about wraps it up. God is strong and he wants you strong. So take everything that the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so that you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no weekend warfare that we'll walk away from and forget about in a few hours. This is for keeps. It is life or death to the finish against the devil and his angels. Be prepared. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help that you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation, they are more than just words. Learn how to apply them because you'll need them through your life. And then it says in verse 18, God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and pray long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up. Encourage one another so that no one falls behind or drops out. So once I read that again, the warning amplified in my spirit when it said, expect the unexpected. God is saying, be prepared. Something is coming. So I started to marinate on this and, and the longer I sat on it, the more urgency I felt that, oh my gosh, we need to get ready. God wouldn't give us the heads up if there wasn't a purpose behind it, if we couldn't win the battle, if we couldn't stand. So I started to pull things together. I said, we need a message on this, but something was missing because we see in part and we prophesy in part. And then Deacon Andre comes in and he preaches that amazing word on unity. And while he's preaching on unity, I start to get this revelation of Ephesians 6 and 10, like I've never seen it before. And it's, God says to me, it doesn't work unless you work together. Unity is a weapon. So let's take a step back from how do we know that's what Paul's intent was when he wrote this passage? Let's look at Ephesians 6 within its context of the book of Ephesians. And we'll, we'll kind of go on this little quick journey of how Ephesians is building us up to be unified so that we can stand against the attacks of the enemy. 
So Paul is writing this to God's people, and he's writing it to the church of Ephesus. And that's kind of a misnomer because the church of Ephesus was actually a loose conglomeration of churches. It was these small individual churches in the vicinity of the larger Ephesus. So while he's writing this, his belief is not one central church. It's smaller churches in the area. And he's giving them instructions throughout the book to build this unified community called the church. And in Ephesians, Paul is taking them through this unity journey because he realizes unity is a weapon against Satan's attacks. So very quickly, I'll take you through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1 and 15 says, love all of God's people, which mirrors what we just read in Ephesians 6 and 18, where it said, watch out for one another. Don't let anybody fall. Ephesians 2 and 2 says, talks about the rulers of the air. In Ephesians 6 and 12, as we go forward, it talks about the principalities and powers of the air. So it's identifying a common enemy before we get to battle and as we are in it. Ephesians 2 and 14 says, he made two out of one and destroyed the divide of hostility. That's going to be key as we continue to go through this. Ephesians 2 and 22, built together to be a dwelling place. We are built together to be the dwelling place of God. Ephesians 3 and 10, God's intent is through the church that his wisdom might be known to who? The rulers and authorities of heavenly realms. In other words, the church should reflect the personality and the power and the wisdom of God to God's enemies, whether they're on the earth or in the heavens. Ephesians 4 and 3, specifically Paul encourages them, keep the unity of the spirit, capital S-P-I-R-I-T, which means the unity of the spirit of God. It's bigger than ourselves. Ephesians 4 and 13, stay unified in the faith. Ephesians 4 and 14, don't be tossed back and forth. Be firm. Where do we hear that again? Ephesians 6, stand firm. He's building, he's building, he's giving them instructions, and he's encouraging them to get to this place so that they might win the battle. Ephesians 4 and 32, be compassionate and forgive one another because forgiveness is the essential sauce to unity. It's the secret sauce behind making things work together. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Ephesians 5 and 21, submit to one another or prefer one another, put somebody else ahead of yourself. And Ephesians 5 and 30, we are members of his one body. That'll be key too. So Paul spends literally five chapters talking about unity and relationships only to end with instructions on how to fight warfare because unity is that vital to winning the battle ahead. So how do we achieve unity? Well, three things need to occur simultaneously. You can't have one occur and then not the other. You need all three. They are the secret sauce of unity. It's respect, forgiveness, and agreement. We need respect for one another, we need to forgive one another, and we need to be in agreement. So let's work in reverse order. Let's talk about agreement. Agreement in Ephesians 4 and 13, Paul is explicit. Stay unified in the faith. And when I was thinking about this, I would think pre-pandemic, when I used to go to the Wells Fargo Center to watch the Flyers play, Everybody who would go down there was already in agreement because that's our team. And forget it if we were playing the, pot, the Penguins because now we have a common enemy. So you would see us wearing the same colors. You would hear us wearing the same, or saying the same, the same encouragements or the same chants, you know, let's go Flyers. <laughs> Nobody had to teach it to us. It just would rise up from the crowd and it would come out. And it occurred to me, the chants and the cheers and the colors, they're not the cause of the agreement, but the end result, because we had already purposed to be agreed. Unity was reflected by how we dressed, what we said, and what we did. And you know what? It's the same thing. Unity is the, it's the end result of unity. It's not the cause of it. But how we speak, 
and how we dress and how we act and the things we do reflect our unity. And what is our unity? We are unified and we are agreeing in the spirit. We agree that Jesus Christ is the son of God who died for our sins. We agree that there is no remission of sins without the shedding of his blood. We agree in the apostles doctrine. We agree in speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives utterance. We agree in baptism in Jesus name. We agree that salvation is for everyone, that everyone has a chance. We agree that God is the head of this church. We agree that we are part of the body of Jesus Christ. We agree. So we've already got one part of unity down because we are in agreement. But then the next part is the hard part, and that's forgiveness. Going back to Ephesians 4 and 32, it says, be compassionate and forgive. Forgiveness is not necessarily a feeling. It is a deliberate and it's an intentional choice. But you can't have forgiveness without a little bit of compassion. Matthew 18, 21 and 22 says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? So he's talking about the people he comes in contact with. He's talking about his, his, those who he's in agreement with the faith. There's going to be conflicts. There's going to be times where we individually disagree. There's going to be times where as a church, you hurt the person sitting next to you. That is just a fact of life. But he says, how often should I forgive him? Seven times seven? So he's already, Peter's trying to say, well, what's the limit? At what point do I get to cut them off? Because they are now inconvenient to me. And Jesus responds and says, saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. In other words, keep forgiving. Keep letting it go. Keep releasing yourself from it. And the hard part about that is forgiveness does not change behavior. And that is where we struggle. Because when someone wrongs you, when someone hurts you, when there's a misunderstanding or a misagreement, you want the end result to be, let's change that behavior so it doesn't occur again. I don't wanna be hurt again. I don't wanna be angry again. I don't wanna be frightened. I don't wanna to have to deal with this stress again. But forgiveness doesn't necessarily do that. And that's one of the reasons it's so hard. But forgiveness releases you. And what does it release you from? It releases you from that dividing spirit of hostility that Paul talked about in 2 and 14. When you forgive, you're no longer hostile to the person that you've forgiven. Sometimes the feelings might rise up, but you don't have that animosity or that division between you two because you've decided to let it go. So you have agreement, you have forgiveness, and now you need respect. We need to treat one another with respect. It's very hard to work with someone who, you're not, who is not respectful to you. Nobody wants to walk into place, especially a church, and feel like they've been disrespected. Ephesians 5 and 21 says, submit or prefer one to another. A good rule of thumb, treat the person next to you as the way you would want to be treated or the way you know they want to be treated. So this respect point though brings us back into Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 9 and Paul actually explains spends half this chapter explaining how to treat one another with respect in relationships regardless of the position. What do I mean? Ephesians 6 1 through 9 and this is the King James Version. Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and may, thou mayest live long on the earth. And, this is not instead of, and, fathers, parents, adults, caregivers, provoke not your children to wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So what Paul is saying is there is a duty on children to be respectful to their parents. But there's also a duty to parents to be nurturing and supportive and respectful back to their children. Paul is not saying it's okay for you to tell your child they're dumb. It's not okay to tell your child they're a loser. There, as a parent, he's saying nurture them in the admonition of who? The Lord. So what the Lord says about your child, you need to speak as the Lord would speak to your child. Same thing with children. You can't just talk to your parents any kind of way. You have to speak to them as you were speaking to the Lord. Why? Because it maintains respect. So he's establishing respect 
in family relationships. But then he goes a step further in verse 5. He says servants. And the word servant can be translated to minister. So take it in the context of a structure or a church organization. It says servants or ministers. Be obedient to them that are your masters or your leaders. Even when you're a leader, you still have a leader. According to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, do service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same he shall receive of the Lord, whether he's bond or free. And ye masters or leaders, do the same thing to those who you are leading. Forbear threatening, which means don't talk to your, if you're a leader, don't talk to people any kind of way. Don't threaten people. Treat them with love and respect. Knowing that your master who is also in heaven, neither is there respect of persons within him. If God is not overly concerned with everybody's position in life, we can't be either. There's an old saying that says you treat everybody the same from the CEO to the janitor. And in and of itself is kind of saying that the janitor is less than the CEO. It's not less, it's just different. But you have to treat everyone with respect. So once Paul has established these relational issues, these relational respectful boundaries, and he's established agreement, and he's talking about forgiveness, he brings us back to Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, and this is the fight. And this is how we fight it. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 is not for individual battle. And I can't tell you how long I've always applied this scripture to myself individually when things were going tough. But without the context of the rest of Ephesians, it's very easy to do that. But it is for unified battle. Remember we read in the beginning, this is more than you can handle on your own. You have to be able to work with the person next to you. So Paul's writing to these groups of churches in Ephesus with his intent for them to unify individually or relationally, as he was talking about, and then collectively with other churches. It's not just the people within your church. The other churches that you are familiar with need to be able to be unified. Then in six, then going to verse 10, he says, our struggle is not with flesh and blood. It's not with each other. Deacon Carroll put that so eloquently last week. We can't be, our, our struggle is not with each other. You know what it's with? It's with spirits of division that want to see the, the church weakened and vulnerable. It's with spirits of division that want to keep us from dwelling together in unity. It's spirits of division that want to make us look at our brother and sister and judge them or hold grievances against them or be offended by everything everyone does. That is a spirit of division and that is not from God. And that is what we need to fight because unity fights division. Division tries to break these relationships because if they are broken, the church as a whole cannot fight because you can't trust each other. And trust is essential to this mode of warfare. Let me tell you what I mean. Paul is writing this and he's talking about take your shield and your sword. And Paul is very well versed with Roman culture. And in Roman culture, shield warfare is a, it's a defensive weapon that required all of the soldiers in the line to work together. They created what's called a shield wall. So they would take their shields, pretty lengthy, covered most of their body, and they would line up. But as the combat formation would clo draw closer to battle, the soldiers had to be side by side in ranks, and just before contact with the enemy, they would move in close together so that each man's shield helped to protect the man on his left. Say on your left. Now for everybody at home who just said on your left, thank you. It was a little fun, right? So this battle formation called the phalanx was, very, was a difficult barrier to break through. And if a man on the front was killed, he was replaced by the man behind. The shields would not only be used to protect the soldiers, but to push the enemy soldiers to the ground and make them break ranks. 
So what's going on here is number one, the person in front was no more important or no less important than the person behind them because if they fell, they needed to take up that position, which is why we need to respect one another. If you fall, if you're injured, if you're down, the person behind you can take that position and protect you with their shield of faith until you can get back up and take your place in line. This warfare only worked with trust. It was essential. Unity was essential for it to work. I can't take my shield of faith and cover you if I am not unified with you. And I can't be covered by your shield of faith if I don't trust you. So there was no one more important. The people in the back were just as vital as those in the front. And they had to protect the man on the left to keep the enemy from baking, breaking through on your left. So he talks about the shield. What about the sword? And the sword is the word of God. It's an indispensable weapon. And as I was looking at this, all I kept hearing from God was, it is written from Matthew 4. And it started to come to me. And the Lord said, Satan uses what God has already told you that he's going to do, that he's already promised you, that he's already written in his word, that he's spoken through his rainbow word, that he's spoken through his prophetic word. God has already said it, but Satan uses that to seduce you to taking it from Satan's realm and not God's. He wants you to bypass God's process and God's glory. And this is why you have to know what is written. So I'll give you an example. In the beginning of the year, I got a prophetic word as a promise that a blessing was on its way to me. It was very explicit the way this word came to me. And the very next day I was presented with an opportunity for the same blessing. But I would have had to go to the blessing versus it coming to me. It's a very subtle and small difference. And emotionally, you can get very excited and say, oh, it's here. But the Lord didn't say for me to go to is a slight difference. And I could not get that slight difference out of my spirit. And I let the blessing pass me by. And you're probably thinking, oh gosh, well, you missed your blessing. I hadn't thought about it until I started to prepare this message. I had complete peace in my spirit. I'm still anticipating it. But had I not known what God had said and not known what God was written, God is so specific when he speaks. If he says the blessing is coming, it's coming. If he says you're going, you're going. God does not misspeak. So we have to know what the word of God says, and we have to know what the promises and the blessings are for us individually. Because it takes away the power of Satan to lie to you, to seduce you, to trick and deceive you. Knowing this slight difference, that is how you use your, your sword of the spirit. Because a sword cuts and it kills. The sword, the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, it cuts through seduction and kills the lie of the enemy. We see this in Matthew 4 and 3, where he said, turn this bread into stone. Satan takes in Jesus into the wilderness, and he's tempting him, and he comes up to him, and he says, I know you're hungry. Take this stone and turn it into bread so that you can eat. But we have to look at what this really means, because in the Old Testament, stones were used for very little by a nomadic tribe outside of altars and graves. So stones were used to mark death, but bread feeds life. Satan wanted Jesus to bypass his process of miracles, which was designed to inspire faith and glorify God so the gospel could be preached and unbelievers could believe. But Satan tried to get him to bypass that and take from his realm. But Jesus knew it is written. Then he goes and he stands on the high point of the temple and says, throw yourself, Jesus, throw yourself down, because if you do, God's angels have charge over you and they'll pick you up and they'll restore you. But Jesus knew he needed to go to the cross. He needed that crucifixion process. And he had to eventually lay his life down willingly, whether he was going to be ministered to or not, suffering the cross. He was not going to bypass God's process. In Matthew 4 and 9, Satan again tries to seduce Jesus into coming to a promise that God has already given to him, but bypassing the process. He says, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. I'll make sure they turn and worship you. 
But we already know that the word says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Jesus already had it. He just had to walk out the process and the path that God had designed for him. So he came back and said, it is written. We have to know what is written in this season. Paul's instructions were, use the word, pray in the spirit, and stay together. Going back to the message version, let's look at it again. It says, be prepared, verse 13. In other words, be prepared. Like Marta said, expect the unexpected. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Yes, we need God, but we need each other. This is not a battle that is won when you're off by your own. Going to verse 18, God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. So we know this battle that's coming is going to last a little while. What does he say? He says, pray long and hard, which means you got to put the work in. You have to put the hours in. You have to be on the prayer calls. Who is he praying for? Pray for your brothers and your sisters. Keep your eyes open. Watchmen, be on the wall in this season. Look, go back into the spirit. Thank God Nada and Marta were listening to what saith the Lord because now we have time to prepare because they were on their post. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up. Encouragers, you need to go out and get a word from the Lord and encourage the people around you. Don't wait until you see a situation. Be proactive. Go out and reach out to your brother and sister. Even if you're just telling them, I like your shoes. I like your dress. I really like that, that meal you cooked. Encourage one another. Keep each other's spirits up. Why? So that no one, no one falls behind and no one drops out. We can't lose anyone if we want to win this fight. So our weapons, praying in the spirit, because praying brings you into agreement with the spirit. The word, because the word is truth. And the, word, the truth removes all power of the enemy because he operates in lies. Unity, I love this. Unity allows us to operate as the body of Christ. Ephesians 5 and 30 says, we are many members, but one body. And I'm going to be honest, the last time I checked, he has never been defeated. So if we are operating as the body of Christ, we cannot lose. We cannot fail, but we have to operate as a body in unity, not a body that's lean. So I just want to encourage you, Morningstar. I want to encourage you at this point, before we close. I've said a lot of things. And sometimes we hear a word of warning, we hear a word of impending warfare, we can become fearful, or we can become anxious. But God did not send this warning if we are not able to stand. He would not reveal our tools if we couldn't be unified. Do not let the devil provoke you into a fight alone. You're not alone. You can't be alone because we are with you. Do not fall into complacency. It might be very easy to say, you know what, I'm getting tired. I don't need to watch the video. I don't need to join the prayer call. I don't need to study because I'm not going. Don't fall into complacency because that makes you easy pickings. But we're not going to let you fall by the wayside. This might be unexpected to us, but God is fully aware, fully aware of it. And because we had people listening to and for the voice of God, we have time to prepare. Now that time, it might be a day. It might be a week. Sometimes when we hear these things, we think we have more time than we do to get ready. I can't tell you how long it is, but God has given us a call to ready our weapons make right our relationships, pray without ceasing, and know what is written so that we can stand in unity. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today, God. 
Lord, we bind the spirit of division that's coming against your church, Lord, because we, according to your word, will stand, God, in the name of Jesus. We, according to your word, will prevail, God, in the name of Jesus. We bind every spirit of division and disunity. We disagree, Lord God, with the spirit of division. We break its chains right now in the name of Jesus. We stand together, Lord God. We encourage one another, God. We are, Lord God, unified in your spirit, Lord, and you, Lord, have never been defeated. So we stand on your word today, Lord, and we know because you spoke it, God, it will prevail. Help us to prepare. Help us to unify. Give us the revelation of the word. Help to sustain us on our prayer and the spirit, Lord, so that at the end of this thing, whatever it might be, whichever way it might come, which however unexpected it might be, Lord, we will stand as a beacon for you and you will be glorified in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed, pray for each other, and encourage one another in Jesus' name.